welcome everybody um, to the latest in this sequence of uh, QModules feedback sessions where we sort of update on the progress we're making with QModules. Um, our last, we hold these sessions sort of fortnightly um, and so here we're here to sort of talk about what progress we've made since the last call back on the 25th of January. Um, so the agenda for today, I just want to give a quick refresher on where we stand on QGetGo and generated Q because that's an important part of what we're doing with the module side of things. Um, give an update on the wider sort of progress within the modules space. Uh, talk about the upcoming release that we're working towards and a short walkthrough or demo of the new modules tutorial as well. Um, so I missed the last call and um, thanks to those who joined um, and contributed to that session, um, especially uh, Richard, I think you're on the call Richard as well, was sort of flagging early that there's, there's a blocker as part of our modules, initial modules released as far as generated uh, queue is concerned. Um, whilst we've actually fixed that by unblocking modules development by supporting the queue.mod gen directory, it's not like we've totally therefore forgotten about the issue. It's very much front of mind in what we're doing. Uh, indeed, we're holding in, um, feedback sessions with individuals to better understand their usage of queue get go, um, but also understand the slightly wider context of what problems people are trying to solve uh, from a configuration perspective and make sure we're not just looking at the, the sort of the, the microscopic usage of QGetGo, but understanding fundamentally what people are trying to achieve. Um, thanks to those who have already um, given time to, to talk through those problems with us. Um, please let us know if you're willing to discuss your use case, um, ideas, feedback you might have for the modules proposal in general, and, and especially the QGetGo and generated side of things as well. Um, a key part of that has been exploring with folks how this idea of uh, dependency islands or self-contained um, bits of queue might work. Um, and again, we're exploring those that concept of dependency islands um, as well as published versions of generated queue, whether they be from Go or other sources um, actively right now and looked forward to sharing more details on that, which will hopefully um, also reflect some of the feedback we've again from some of these uh, sessions we've had with folks explore, uh, explaining their use cases. So thanks and um, please let us know if you would like to discuss your use case in any more detail. Um, so now on to a sort of a slightly wider progress update on the module side of things. Um, as we talked about the, the support, um, the q.mod gen support fix has been submitted. That's a bit of a mouthful, that first sentence there. Um, Rog, thanks for working on that. And again, Richard, thanks for helping to flag that in the first place. Um, we think that unblocks things as far as the generated code is concerned. Please let us know if that's not the case. As we summarized on the last call, effectively the support we have landed for now brings the use of q.mod gen, pkg, and user in line with as you can imagine, sort of like a vendor directory on the Go side of things. Um, that's the, the, the least invasive minimal change we can make to unblock things on the module side of things. But as I said, we're exploring better solutions um, in parallel as well. Um, Rog, I think we had a couple of bug fixes on the OCI registry package indeed. I think we've got some folks actually from outside, the, uh, other folks using the OCI registry um, module as well. Yeah, yeah, there's been some interest from the actual OCI community because it, it, it supports some some use cases that aren't actually supported by any of the other uh, like OCI helper packages um, in Go um, and in quite a neat way, I think. And they they yeah, they certainly seem to seem to be liking it. So it's quite nice uh, nice thing to happen. And also they're they're likely to be using it in different circumstances, so it should be more robust as a, as a result. And they're finding issues and things getting involved. So just but it's quite nice to see. Yep, great. And just as a refresher, this OCI, the, the, we, the reason this module is separate is that we want this to be as minimal uh, an implementation as possible um, uh, of this part of the OCI uh, registry spec. Um, uh, uh, sort of unlike existing implementations, which are quite dependency heavy, this is intentionally very minimal. It's used as part of the main queue project, but absolutely as Rog, Rog suggested, totally open for others to, to use and depend on as well. So please give us feedback of anything. Um, you spot anything or 
issues with the API, API, whatever it might be. Yes, Rog. Uh, I'll just say that the, the, the one piece of functionality I mentioned specifically, the one piece of functionality it offers, which others don't, if it, which might be useful for people wanting to run integration tests, is the ability to easily, quickly start an in-memory OCI server component, which is something, yeah, I don't think there's, there's not really any, uh, with, with full customizability as well, uh, which where, yeah, we are using a lot in our tests, like all over the place. Um, so, so, and it's super useful. So that's something that you won't get from other, other um, OCI related repos. You do a you do a good sales pitch, Rog, on the OCI registry module. Um, that's a beautiful segue, actually, into the fact that we have caught a number of bugs um, as part of the initial modules implementation. Um, that bugs in the, the sort of the core QLang Q code. And many have been caught by the integration tests that do use that um, OCI registry module. And Richard, Richard, thank you again. I'm going to embarrass you by explicitly calling out um, the fact that you've been giving this a uh, road test ahead of time. Um, uh, Daniel remarked, remarked to me earlier on that Richard's better than our integration tests. Please rest assured, Richard, we won't be relying on you as our integration tests, and we are um, feverishly working to build out the integration tests in such a way that it's cheap and easy to add new ones, um, which is going to become more significant as we add more modules features, but also as we support things like the central registry as well. So thanks again, Richard. Uh, Daniel, anything to add on the integration test side of things? Uh, just one minor thing to add is that we, we've we had end-to-end -end tests in the main theory repo for some time, but as of a week ago, a couple of weeks ago, they used QMOD Publish now. So they use the, the flow that we intend to release with the experiment with the first alpha. Uh, and if you go and see that diff or just read the whole, the whole test in master, it is pretty close to what a human would do. Barring the only thing that it doesn't do quite the same is the the authentication to just hard code the token in CI. Super, thank you. Um, the, the main thrust of what we've been doing over the last um, couple of weeks has been preparing for the 0 0.8.0 Alpha 1 release, and we'll talk a bit more about that on the next um, slide. Um, just to mention, and certainly not to forget, the um, the fact that we're working on a um, an experimental central registry implementation as well. Um, work on that is progressing very nicely, um, and we will do a demo of that on the next update call in a couple of weeks' time. Um, including the um, integration that we have with um, GitHub-based repositories um, as part of that. So I look forward to showing that to you next time. Um, so moving on to the 0 0.8.0 Alpha 1 release, um, this was, uh, Marcel touched on this in the previous update, um, at a very high level, and the release notes will go into more detail on this. Um, this release is going to be an initial release that covers our support for the experimental queue modules. Um, we're going to limit it in this Alpha 1 release to the publishing and fetching of queue modules to and from custom registries. Um, I noted that we used the, the term private registries last time. Um, we, we're trying to arrive at some slightly more um, precise language around that, so any suggestions, welcome. Private gives the perhaps incorrect uh, idea that these things aren't public, whereas they might be public instances of an OCI registry and limited by some sort of authentication. So custom registries is really just the term we're using for now until a better one comes along to refer to any um, OCI compatible registry that is not the central registry, the, the experimental central registry that we're working on. So that's what we mean by custom registries. And we'll see a bit more of that in a second when we come to Rog walking us through the um, modules tutorial that we've drafted as well. Um, Rog, I think I'm saying that QMod Tidy is now fully working with even a couple of bug fixes to boot um, compared to last time. Um, I, I can't remember when we demoed QMod Tidy it will have been four weeks ago now. I don't think we were fully up and running. So I've really only listed QMod Tidy here to, to make clear to folks that QMod Tidy will be there to help. And it's a key part of the modules tutorial as well. Um, so that's the only reason I specifically call it. Anything you want to add on that? Um, yeah, I'd say it, um, it, it, I haven't seen it panic in ages, well, at least today. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'd say that when we say it's fully working, there are definitely some features we want to add. 
Um, for example, at the moment, it doesn't distinguish between direct and indirect dependencies, which is super useful to see in your queue file. There are some formatting changes that will probably do. So there's definitely things to do, but at the moment, it it, it, it works pretty, pretty okay. Great. Well, at least it's fully working as far as the features we wanted to support were concerned. I'll get out of jail with that one. Um, the modules tutorial will, that we publish on alpha.qlang.org and the first cut of modules reference um, will sort of effectively also be part of this release as well, even though they're sort of orthogonal and not tied to the release per se. <clears throat> as we talked about before, um, the gen user and PKG directories are still supported um, in the way that was just um, discussed on the previous call, just within the main module. Um, like vendoring and go. Um, the timeline for the release, uh, we're looking to cut that release tomorrow, the 9th of February. Um, the release notes will contain more details about the non-modules related changes, um, as well as linking to the, um, the docs for this experimental support on alpha.qlang.org. Um, alpha um, so I think, uh, that is it. Anything else, Rog, Daniel, Marcel on no zero on F or one? Um, we'll keep um, the modules channel on Slack updated. Um, it's great. Folks asking questions there is great, but we'll also use it as a bit of an async way of just providing a bit more of a uh, light touch update on how things are going. And of course, when the release itself is cut, we'll let people know um, via Twitter and Blue Sky as well. Um, so now a quick walkthrough of the modules tutorial, if that works, Rog. Um, I'm just going to have to do a bit of gymnastics here to get a new tab shared. So give me one second. I thought I could actually just um, just do, walk through it interactively and people could sort of follow through in their own. I, don't, I could actually run the commands in the shell, which is what I was vaguely planning to do. Uh, um, I think it's probably worth us just doing it, just having a glance over the, the okay. doc itself uh, and leaving folks to do that because otherwise there's a, um, not to say um, it would be boring to do that, but at the same time, the, the as we'll see, hopefully it'll be quite um, an interactive, uh, it'll have an interactive feel, feel to it as we walk through the tutorial. In, in which case, I, I could share my screen and just, just put that on. Oh, by all means, if you want to, yeah. Because then I can scroll at, at, at will. Let me stop oh. showing my screen, please do. Um, just whilst Roger's doing that, um, alpha.qlang.org, um, there's a number of bits of content that have landed on there. We are going to use um, this opportunity to restart the docs and content calls, um, discussing the content that's on alpha.qlang.org, which obviously raises the main question of, well, why is alpha.qlang.org still alpha.qlang.org and not qlang.org. Um, the one remaining piece on that is to finesse the front page, which we are working on as well. Um, and some point before the middle of March, we will do that flip over from alpha.qlang.org to qlang.org. And so we'll be then live with all the goodness that folks have on alpha.qlang.org now. Um, Rog, can I hand over to you and just suggest maybe one one more um, increment in size. More zoom. That would Oops. be perfect. I wonder, like that. That looks perfect to me. Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, so yeah. So, um, well, you can see this is the the entry point. And this is alpha.qlang. Oh, we have a grand total of two um, tutorials now, um, and this one is working with a, a custom module registry. Um, and you can see um, that, that we're going to do a bunch of things which basically involve um, pushing and consuming modules from the um, from 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 registries um, and of course it's experimental for now um, you'll need some stuff some awareness of Q we kind of take as a prerequisite um, and then we so the the, the basic idea is that um, we've got this imaginary application which is going to consume some YAML and we want uh, we want um, a, a schema that that's going to that, that that's the that constraints the configuration for that um and we want to share that between several consumers that are both uh, that are all going to use that same configuration um so um so you know we've got it's all all got a sort of cold theme so it's glacial tech and frosty config just for a random uh, ra random names um and uh, yes cool so just to briefly as you hover over one of those um 
uh, terminals there, Rog. You can folks can just see the copy button that's on the right hand side here. For the commands and the code that follows, you can use that copy button to helpfully sort of copy paste things as we go. Um, if you actually want to be trying this locally, and as Daniel said, either using the version from the tip at the moment, or when we actually cut the alpha tomorrow, using that alpha alpha one release. Yeah. Um, uh, and I will, I will also mention that almost all the things on this on alpha.qlang.org are automatically tested. This particular one, because it talks to uh, an external registry, is not. But that's definitely a not yet. All this is going to be like you know tested to to make sure that it actually really does work uh, properly. Um, so so we're going to start with the the schema module. Gonna uh, we're going to publish this. So we do a QMod in it. Now this is something you might not have seen before. It's the uh, basically the major version suffix. Basically all modules have a major version, and you have to specify that. Um, actually, it will infer v0 if you don't uh, if you don't add it. Um, and it talks a little bit about uh, the restrictions of module names. And we have this very arbitrary configuration, which is what we're going to represent the YAML configuration for the uh, for, for this application. Um, and then we can, uh, like in this case, you, you can actually start with Docker run uh, your own registry. That's kind of really useful. Um, just to, if you want, if you want a registry to play with, you can just do that. And there you have a registry that is available to, to play with. Um, which is quite nice, um, and we know we always require at the moment because it's an experiment. You have to enable it by by setting Q experiment equals modules, um, and then here we're just pointing it at this local registry that we've just started, and we're saying that all modules can be stored underneath Q slash Q modules inside that registry. Um, and then we're going to run cube to tidy and that that basically canonicalizes the module.q file in this case that's actually probably not going to do anything at all because there are no dependencies um, and then publish it uh, with qmod publish and that publishes to where the q registry is so that actually goes and uploads it to the to the network or to the to the registry um, and then we're going to create an application that actually uh, that actually depends on that uh, we could call it frosty app Again, it's going to have a, a similarly cold name, um, and uh, and and here's our. So here we're we're actually importing it. No, we're using at v zero there. Actually, uh, as currently, um, we have a feature which we call um, inf um, default major versions, which means that you don't have to say that. You can have it inferred the the major version inferred from the uh, the module.q file. Um, and and here we are. We've actually defined some some data, um, and and we can we we do more tidy at this point. We it sees this import and and goes to the network, goes to the registry, and finds available an available application an available uh, module, um, and then updates and and updates the 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 budget of file Q file. So it looks like this. So now we see our our module here, and we have some dependencies in there, which includes this uh, this frosty config package that we um, module that we just published um, and this is sort of diagrammatically yeah frosty app is dependent on v001 of frosty config um, so we can evaluate it just like normally um, like you would normally and there it, there it works um, and then we like as a kind of like one step more maybe maybe we want something that's actually going to provide some defaults but as a separate module, not as part of the same module as, as the configuration module. So we'll call it Frosty Template, um, and that's going to define some defaults for our configuration. And that itself is going to depend on, on the configuration schema. It could be just another package in the same um, in the same module, but for this illustration, it's useful to have it separate. And also, in lots of cases, it's actually quite useful to have the defaults separate because the schema might come from some totally other source of truth or be controlled by someone else. Um, so in this case here, we're, 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 we've got these defaults. We'll publish it. Again, we'll call it v001. It's just v001 of this, this particular package. Um, and now we can update the, um, the, uh, the, 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 our application to use the template instead of the, uh, instead of the original um, Frosty config module for package. Uh, and so we, we can it means we can actually remove some of the data because they're now now um, uh, now um, uh, implied by the by the template. 
Um, uh, I should probably have um, shown the output of, of that um, queue export YAML after that. Um, and then, uh, well, actually, we'd need to run tidy first because then that updates our dependencies. And now we can see we're, uh, we're dependent on both config and frosty template. Um, and in the future, as I alluded to earlier, these will be marked like this one is now indirect and this one's direct. Um, so that would be that. And it's quite useful to know, certainly from my Go experience, it's quite useful to know which ones you directly depend on. So now our sort of diagram looks like this. Uh, and now when we render it, we see the output and it has the various various things that we added um, to the template. Uh, to, so with the template, the defaults for the template. So we can say that port 80, for example, wasn't actually mentioned in, in here, but now is, is defaulted to. Um, and then, it, it, and then the, the next part of the scenario is that, well, maybe the schema changes. We want to add a new field. In this case, we'll call it max concurrency. So we've changed Frosty config and we'll add this, this new max concurrency field. So the, the schema has changed. Um, but maybe the um, the template, we uh, in this case, we, we're going to publish a new version, v010, not 001. Uh, the minor version updates because it's changed in a backwardly compatible way. Um, and then we want to update our Frosty app module, which is, we will just, this is going to change. Um, like at the moment, we're going to manually edit the, the, uh, the module.q file. Um, in the future, you'll probably be able to do some command to automatically update a version. But update, adding it's not too bad. Uh, like editing it is not too bad. So now we're using v10. And we'll see that actually, um, this is this is what our diagram looks like now. Well, we're we're dependent on Frosty template, that which itself depends on v001. But because we're using, we have a direct dependency on v010, the actual version of Frosty config is go that's going to be chosen is v010. So we'll we'll the the bottom level version will be, even though even though Frosty template relied on was relying on this because of the MVS algorithm. We're going to update this dependency so that we're all depending on the same schema itself. Um, and we check, and it uh, well, we, we would see if I'd include the output, it would 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 just work. Um, so that's a very brief overview of that that tutorial. But hopefully, that's helpful for people to get started. Uh, I will stop presenting. Any any well, first any any questions? No, I'll stop presenting. Um, I saw a couple of reactions. Um, Roger, that's awesome. Thank you. This is just a note that this is the um, first cut tutorial. Roger, you're also working on um, uh, an initial cut of the reference material, as I talked about earlier on. Do you want to just give a bit of an overview of, of what that reference material, effectively the scope of that reference material? Why would people look at the reference material versus the tutorial? Yeah, so so I mean, clearly the 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 tutorial skims over a lot of actual detail. The the reference uh, material is meant to be a definitive reference for how for everything about um, how the how the modules work. It's it's actually a moral equivalent to actually somewhat derived from because uh, they're quite related. Um, the Go ref um, reference modules reference documentation. Um, because they, they, the, the two things, although they're, they're marked differences, they also they also share a lot of heritage. Um, so that's that's fairly close to landing now. Um, I would say it's a great, probably a, two or three more rounds of review, um, and that should uh, that should be there um, and should document. Uh, you know, should should explain. Uh, well, certainly in in the future, it will be an absolute definitive reference for for how the what the semantics are, how how, how it all works. Um, Super. Um, just a reminder, everything is experimental here. So the, the fact that there are going to be some rough edges here and there is more a reflection of things being experimental rather than us trying to polish them. So um, we'll very much appreciate feedbacks from folks. Um, the uh, What we do need to do as part of getting this module stuff out there, even in an experimental form, is ensure that linkage with the existing docs is improved, and indeed that the existing docs themselves are improved. Um, we'll be starting that work um, next week. Um, for example, there's existing documentation on what modules, packages, and instances are. 
that will need some um, updating. It will also need linking to the experimental modules tutorial, but where we make changes, it will all sort of be say, just making clear this is experimental, just so that we're not jumping the gun ahead of accepting the modules proposal or any feedback that folks might have before we make a decision on the modules proposal. And as such, we'll restart the docs and content calls. Um, Jonathan, I don't think is on the call today. Jonathan Matthews has been doing a lot of work on the content side of things. Um, he'll be part of those calls and helping to um, steer what we're doing on the documentation side of things to make sure we've got, if you like, the, a consistent voice in our documentation. Um, and if folks have any feedback on, the voice that we use in our documentation tutorials or how to's the level of detail we go to please just let us know um, we'll point out how to at the bottom of each of the pages on alpha.qlang.org there's report an issue link um, that will take you to a pre-filled out template that links back to the page you from which you just clicked uh, so the reporting of issues should be nice and easy um, as as folks start to use these docs more um, I think that's it, unless um, Roger Daniels has anything else. Um, yep, thanks Daniels, been adding a couple of good notes along the way for those folks who are impatient to try this ahead of the release tomorrow. Um, the um, sort of uh, one of the things to note is that we will be publishing discussion soon about how we're looking to uh, improve our communication on what we're doing on the key project and that includes um, how we're milestoning issues etc um, that should be out tomorrow it might be early next week and that will also talk about um, release cadence and why we're going to move to a higher release cadence one of the main reasons being in order that we can get all these changes to, to the modules implementation experimental modules implementation out so that people can try them if if we were only doing a release every six months that would be extremely painful we're going to need to move to a much faster cadence in the short term to get these changes out there at least especially in sort of pre-release form um, so please expect to see more regular releases especially pre-releases in the v0.8.0 series um, and with that i will stop talking in case there are any questions that others would like to jump in with at this point We have silenced the crowd with your modules tutorial, Rog. Um, in which case, we will keep it nice and short today um, and um, share much more of this um, and interact with folks on Slack and stuff once we've got the alpha release out, uh, excuse me, the V0.8.0 alpha one release out there um, when folks have had the opportunity to click through and actually try things out. Um, yeah, Kevin, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's the case that folks actually will want to uh, give this a try. And hopefully the tutorial um, gives a, a flavor for what is um, uh, possible, you know, elite, what at least is possible um, with the 0 0.8.0 alpha one. Um, the one thing that's worth calling out is that the tutorial is, as Rog said, just an introduction. Um, it's very much going to be the case that there are going to be other aspects of modules that, um, or, or techniques or whatever it is that the tu tutorial necessarily will not cover because we're not going to try and make it a definitive reference in any way, shape or form. Um, what we are very likely to do, therefore, is actually uh, create either other tutorials or, as, uh, as I alluded to in one of my messages earlier on, the content we've been creating on alpha.qlang.org right now is very, very much dominated by um, how-tos, where a how-to is really is is a much punchier version um, of a piece of documentation where someone has a specific goal in mind. How do I do X or how do I do Y, how, especially with Q? And the same will be true of modules. So I think it's quite likely that we'll actually be creating quite a lot of um, how-tos along the way. Um, with longer form tutorials being much um, fewer in number um, and dedicated to sort of um, scenarios. Yeah, Roger's just linked to um, available how-to guides. 
Um, and the search functionality up in the top right of alpha.qlang.org is really your friend um, because it, it's impossible when there's lots of content to come up with a good way of indexing and linking these things in a form that is consumable by a human. And search um, the search that's part of the site now is actually really really working quite well um, for me at least please let us know it's not working for you we're tagging the content we're creating as well so for example you could limit your search to modules related there's clearly not very many of such pieces of content right now link uh, limit your search to modules related content um, and that allows you to have sort of more refined searches instead of trawling through indexes of how to's tutorials or references etc so search is a, a good way of a sort of cross-cutting way of finding bits of content you might be interested in. But as I said, we'll talk more about this um, on the docs and content calls that we will restart. And as Roger alluded to, all of the content that we're going to be creating as part of these tutorials, how-tos, et cetera, will be automated in terms of the testing. So we will have high confidence in the content that is published, but also it massively speeds up the rate at which we can create the content as well. Um, because we're not having to go through and test things by hand as we're creating the contents as well. And the docs and content calls are going to be um, 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 uh, Kevin, I'll just come to your point in a second. Um, it will be uh, uh, yeah, so it'll be much quicker to create content and as we as we've taken to um, answering questions on Slack, we're going to start answering questions with basically bits of content that we've either that already exist and or bits of content we've quickly created in response to a question that somebody has answered. Um, I saw something coming in. Let me just take a quick look. Um, Kevin, my personal favorite is just functional examples in a Git repo I can clone and run locally. Um, that is a very good point. And that's also something we could look to m make happen as part of um, any of these bits of content. Kevin, with a tutorial in that situation, just to take Roger's um, tutorial that he walked through today, what would be your expectation there that you have the start point or the end point or effectively start through to end with different commits, if you like, along the way? Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, yeah. certainly can. <laughs> Sorry, I was just, that was just a side comment. The, the how-tos are great, but I found when I'm trying to learn something quickly, I go to GitHub and I search for repos that just have examples of what I'm trying to do. So if you had like a, a QGit package that just had, you know, examples and all these same commands there, then I can use my editor and just read through the comments. You could even have the exact same examples just available on my machine and in my editor. Um, I'm happy to, to talk about that if you, if you want, but um, that's a, um, a comment. That, that's a really good idea for the how-tos, um, especially where there's like a one shot of code with files that have a result. Um, I think that's something we could, I think we could probably do that fairly readily and easily. Tutorials would be somewhat trickier to my mind because they are by definition like a sequence of steps that need to be followed. But I don't think impossible to effectively automate that as well with if you like a commit per step. Um, again, part of the thinking behind uh, some attention on the, making, excuse me, paying some attention to the automation side of things is that these things sh should be easier because we've got them quite structured. Um, that is some really good um, feedback though, Kevin. Let me just mentally log that and follow up and um, see whether we can't do that in fairly short order because effectively as a version of um, alpha.qlang.org is um, generated, what we could then have is like a, um, a, a repo with a directory structure beneath where I don't, I don't we need to sort of think about the, the efficiency of it of of where a, perhaps an, a commit then is generated for all of the examples following following the directory structure etc that that might well be doable i think there's probably a couple of wrinkles to think through there um but very happy to to take a look at that and we'll, we'll um pick that up on the docs and content calls next week
uh, one thing I should note is that the uh, the reason I talk about that is sort of being like a shorter term uh, thing we could do is that fundamentally we want to make the examples on alpha.qlang.org interactive so that you would literally instead of having to um, go to your editor you would if you wanted to and sort of uh, just jump in, click within the editor on, if you remember back to Roger's tutorial, they would be interactive and you'd be able to click each step. That, however, is a, is a much bigger lift when it comes to tutorials. It's less of a lift when it comes to how-tos, but still it's not insignificant. Hence why, even though these things are tested, that's really to help take away the load of maintenance of a lot of this documentation. In the short term, I think we should be able to do sort of like a halfway house, which is the generating of the, the code, as you say. I, th I think that's a really good alternative in, in the shorter term. Super. Um, in which case, uh, with a bit of time to spare, let's call it a day there and look forward to sharing the uh, 0 0.8.0 um, Alpha 1 release with folks. Um, and as part of the content that we're going to be doing in alpha.qlang.org, we're also going to include, um, start working on revi refreshed versions of comparisons with Q to other languages, plus, as I said, linking to um, the existing content that we have from the modules to tour, etc. So look forward to talking a bit more about that on the docs and content calls going forward, but just to sort of give a bit of a preview of what we're going to be focusing on there as well. Anything else from anybody? We also need to do another community call. We are overdue a community call, and so we um, will get one of those penciled in. Um, that actually works quite nicely. Um, in terms of um, the work that Daniel and I have been doing on thinking about how we rework the um, issue handling and also better communicating a roadmap of what it is we're actually working on on the Q project. Kevin? Am I allowed to ask about string embedding or is that a topic for another call? Um, we let us come back. Martel has had some thoughts on that. Um, let us come back to it, uh, if you don't mind. Um, apologies, I have seen, I, th I think you messaged me yesterday. I've been right. super under it the last couple of days. I will reply to your Slack DM, apologies. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks folks. Um, appreciate everyone joining, and we'll share the recording as ever um, yep. so that others can follow. Oh, hey, Marcel. Uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, others feel free to, to drop off. Just one question, uh, Kevin, about the embedding, because I have been talking about it, and uh, also I was just in um, Config Management Camp. It's a, it's a Configuration Management Conference, uh, and there are a bunch of Q users. Um, and, and, you know, like the... Um, the feedback there is that people want to have an interpreted embedding really rather than than just bytes um even though we plan to initially just do bytes but but where do you still stand there uh would you what if you embed a json would you that be wanted to be interpreted as json or bytes and then calling json on marshall basically i want a plain string yeah. so um there, there are cases for interpreted. I would think that you could read the string and pass it through a function to interpret sure. it. Yeah. So it, it's, for me, it's really simple. If you put like a, a code block, like put some Go code, say, into a, a queue like raw string, right? Yeah. So now it's just embedded code, which you're not trying to parse or do anything with. You're just storing it. If, Q requires it to have ex like exactly the right amount of tabs. It's very finicky, so it's not how you would want to edit it. So I'm I'm essentially using Q to gather a bunch of code files and put them together and do a transform and then put it out somewhere else. But you can't edit those files directly within the Q file very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the primary use case, but um, there are some others. Okay, I, th I think that's the right answer, Kevin, as far as the initial version is concerned, because it keeps things know. nice and simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially uh, YAML is, is uh, interesting, right? With its in infinite uh, different interpretations, so you'd have to manage that and then like... Yeah. 
Yeah. For me, what's trickier is like a, a if you just have a an embed with the, the string, that's fine. But sometimes I don't know. I need to use a glob pattern to say like yep. look for star dot SQL and then just import this into a list or a map of um, of those string values. Yeah, that, that that's another uh, uh, big design one, right? Like if you if you have a glob, would you map that like go into a file system where where basically the structure of the files is represented in Q? Or would it be a map with path contents, right? So the, so the letter is, is uh, so the first mimics a file system, which can be handy. The letter is much easier to deal with if you want to process that, right? So that's that's another. Uh, could we could do both potentially, but yeah. Yeah, processing recursive structures in Q is awkward. So yeah, exactly. For the, for the letter, I think. I think just a flat flat list of path names or something would be fine. Yeah, I think that's uh, that is at least we should do that there. Yeah, this is definitely off piste for the modules. Yeah, sorry about that. Probably. That's why I said others. I can knew, I knew, I knew you wouldn't wanna... be able to resist, Marcel. Um, I, I, I can't, you know. Kevin, me. Kevin, you were it was well judged <laughs> to bring it up to know that Marcel wouldn't be able to resist. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was indeed. Um, but, um, I think Kevin, just to, uh, and I will also fall for the nerd snipe as well. Um, I think with the progress we're making on the LSP side of things as well, it's also an incredibly good thing to push on to get an initial version in, because what it allows us to do is then have the LSP be aware of the fact that you are embedding a file and that it needs to do something off the back of a change in the embedded file. And so there are a number of good reasons to, beyond your specific use case, to actually make this a first-class citizen that really then start to pay dividends in the LSP side of things. And just whilst we're on the LSP, I, we're miles off track now, but I might as well keep going. Because mm -hmm. um, I know that you use um, JetBrains, Kevin, a, a nod to that as far as the LSP is concerned. Um, we're working with... Um, someone who has developed the initial version of the Q plugin for JetBrains. Um, he has vast experience in creating lots of different JetBrains plugins in different situations. Uh, and one of the first things that we are going to come to is in our work with him um, is um, looking at how the JetBrains plugin and QPlease should work together. JetBrains plugin can do a certain amount of stuff and it does it incredibly well. But at some point it's either we need to start encoding this stuff into the JetBrains plugin or as is probably the case, delegating in a well-defined way to QPlease. Um, and that way we develop once, i.e. in Q, please, and leverage in all editors, in, including um, on the JetBrains side of things. So I, I just wanted to sort of fill in a couple of gaps there related back to the embedding point, knowing that you and many others depend on the JetBrains side of things to say we're not forgetting about it. It's sort of very much part of the solution. Excellent. Cool. Okay, well, successful nerd tonight from Kevin on the um, the embedding side of things. Um, one nil to Kevin for sure. Um, thank you everyone for joining. We'll um, publish this recording and get version 0 0.8.0 alpha one out as soon as possible with release notes, etc. and look forward to some feedback. Thank you and we'll speak to you next time.